Hi, everybody. OK, so um, let's talk about Chapter 12, Section 3, which is about the pigeonhole principle, which is a kind of counting technique uh, that's based on the very simple idea that if you have, say, 10 balls and eight boxes and you try to fit your 10 balls into your eight boxes, at least one of your boxes is going to have to have more than one ball in it. And that's kind of the whole story. But it turns out to have a lot of uh, amusing applications. So um, here's the statement of the pigeonhole principle. Suppose that you have uh, m and n. These are natural numbers, where m is bigger than n. And you put m balls in n boxes, then at least one box has more than one ball. And we're going to treat this as an axiom. It is possible to prove it from some other axioms, but that would take us too, um, too far down a rabbit hole. If you ever take a rigorous course on set theory, you'll probably get a chance to see the pigeonhole principle proved. But um, we're just going to take it as an axiom. And after all, it does seem pretty obvious. And I do want to mention also that it has a contrapositive version, which says that if you take, if you have m balls and n boxes, and you put the m balls into the n boxes in such a way that no box has more than one ball in it, then there must be fewer um, balls than boxes. And I should have been more careful here because this should be m less than or equal to n. So um, that's that's looking at it from the other point of view. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to interpret this uh, in terms of injective and surjective functions. And uh, so the first result says that if you have a set A, which has more elements than a set B, then there's no injective function from A to B. So here's a picture of that. Here's your set A. And it has, let's say, four elements in it. Just making sure I'm in the right place. And here you have your set B, which has, let's say, three elements in it. And you're going to try to construct a, uh, uh, an injective function from A to B, but you run into trouble. Because to be injective, each point in A has to go to a different, each different pair of points in A have to go to different points in B. That's like saying each ball has to go into a different box. But if there's fewer boxes than balls, you can't do that. And um, in fact, that's how you would put together a proof of this. You can think of your elements of A as balls and the elements of B as boxes. And you can think of the formula f of A equals B as meaning put ball A in box B. And um, if the function is injective, then that means that two different balls go into two different boxes. In other words, no box has more than one ball. But that's a contradiction of our original assumption. Uh, so, I mean, by the pigeonhole principle, that means there have to be at least as many boxes as balls. But that contradicts our assumption that that's not true. I mean, there are more balls than boxes. So if you have, if you, if you, if you try to make an inject, if, if you have a big set and a small set, you can't have an injective function that goes from one to the other. And if you read the contrapositive of this, that says that if you do have an injective function, then that must imply that A has fewer elements, maybe the, less than or equal to the number of elements of B. That's just the contrapositive of this, uh, of this proposition. OK, let's look at this now from the surjectivity point of view. So now we have a function from A to B. So here's A and here's B. And now we have fewer balls than boxes. Uh, 
Um, but we're going to think about, and, and again, we're going to think about, um, but we're going to, now we're going to think of the elements of B as our balls and the elements of A as our boxes. And even though the function goes f of a equals b, we're going to think of this as meaning put ball b in box a. And the fact that it's surjective means that everything in b has to have come from somewhere in a, right? But the pigeonhole principle says since there are more B's than A's, that there have to be two different A. I mean, there have to be um, two different balls put in the same box. So two different B with the same A. But that contradicts something, too. That says, I mean, if you have two different b's with the same a, that means this can't be a function. Because a function can only have one uh, arrow leaving each point in a. In other words, we would have f of a equals b and also f of a um, equals b prime. And that's not, that contradicts the fact that f is a function. So just like you can't have an injective map from a big set to a small set, you can't have a surjective map from a small set to a big set. There's just no way to fit those in together. Now let's, uh, let's see if we can apply this. Uh, the, the funny thing about the original principle is it's often a way to get proofs which are non-constructive. And, and let me give you, an, this is an example straight from the book. Suppose you pick any 10 integers between 1 and 100. So, for example, I don't know, you could pick A is 1, 15, 19, 23, 31, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Hmm. How many have I got? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And uh, I don't know, 34. Then consider subsets X in A. Just take a subset of A. So it, it, it it could be any subset. And let's, let's take the sum of the elements in X. So if I happen to pick the subset 15, 19, then that would go to 34. And what this proposition says is that you can be absolutely guaranteed, so you're guaranteed that there are two subsets, x and y, different from each other with the same sum. Now, it's a non-constructive proof. It's not going to tell you how to find that. It's sort of magic. It's just going to tell you how it works. And the proof is the pigeonhole principle. And here's the idea. How many subsets are there of A? Well, A has 10 elements, so there are 2 to the 10th, which is 1,024 subsets of A. And what do we know about the sums? If we, check, if we choose, if X is an element of um, a, a subset of, the, of, of 10 integers, so x has 10 integers between 1 and 100. How big could that number be? So the sum of those 10 integers is at most 10 times 100, which is 1,000. So here's the picture. You have 1,024 subsets. And each subset maps to a sum between 0 and 1,000. 
So there are more subsets here than there are sums. And so the pigeonhole principle says two subsets must have the same sum just by counting, even though we don't really know anything about what those subsets might be. Okay, let's take a look at this problem, 12.3.5, uh, uh, which I pulled out of the book. And it's, it's uh, actually a little tricky, and it, it says the following. Prove that any set of seven distinct natural numbers always contains a pair of numbers whose sum or difference is divisible by 10. So, um, I mean, we can try an experiment. Let's just pick at random seven numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, and um, seven. And let's see, is it true that two of them have a summer difference which is divisible by 10? And actually, it, it, it is true. Um, 255 and 15, both their sum and difference is divisible by 10. And uh, that might be the only... Oh, and also 139 minus 59. Their difference is divisible by 10. So in this case, actually, there are two, there are two cases uh, where it's divisible by 10. Now, to prove this, we want to use the, um, the pigeonhole principle. And so we need to somehow uh, generate a lot of examples where the um, uh, where we have, I mean, what's the right way to put this? To be divisible by 10 is to say that your ones digit is, is a zero. So you have seven numbers, and you want to sort of look at the number of possible kind of differences between them or sums between them and see that there's enough of them to force one of those sums or differences to be have a zero in the ones digit. So um, let's do this in the following way. We... Um, we can write our numbers down in, in increasing order. Okay. And um, let's just look at, at what how many differences and, and, and so forth we have. Well, we have A1 minus, we can look at A1 minus A2, A1 minus A3, A1 minus A4, A1 minus A5, A1 minus A6 and a1 minus a7, right? And we can also look at a1 plus a2, a1 plus a3, a1 plus a4, a1 plus a5, a1 plus a6, and a1 plus a7. And there's a total here of 12 numbers. And their ones digit have to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. Uh, those are the only possibilities, right? So if we have 12 of these numbers, and they all have to have digits 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, then there has to be a pair. There's a pair. Let's say a1 plus or minus a i and a1 plus or minus a j, where i is not equal to j, so that these two have the same ones digit. So that's our first application of the pigeonhole principle. But it doesn't get us what we want because that one's digit might not be zero. But here's where the trick comes in. Now, if we take look at the sum or difference of these two numbers, because they both have a1, if we take a1 um, plus or minus a i minus a1 plus or minus a j, the a1s cancel out and we get 
plus or minus a i minus or plus a j. And since these guys have the same ones digit, this has zero as a ones digit. And so it's divisible by 10. So this is a kind of a interesting trick on the pigeonhole principle. We we're, we're trying to prove two things. We're trying to get two things to, to add to zero. So our first step is to get two things which sort of add to the same number, and then we take their difference, and then they're going to add to zero. Here's an interesting thing to think about. Is seven, could you do this with six? Well, if you did it with six, what would happen? You would have only 10 numbers here, and you have 10 digits here. So you, the pigeonhole principle wouldn't give you two of the same. And so you wouldn't be able to guarantee that, um, that the thing that you wanted works. So um, it is, should be possible to find six numbers six, such that their sum or difference, none of their sums or differences is divisible by 10. And uh, I invite you to try to figure out an example of such a thing.